show is sponsored by Hive Mind CRM. It is more than just a CRM. It is a real estate and business mastermind that comes with an all-in-one CRM. You can have unlimited websites and users. You can call, text, RVM, and email all in one user interface. And you can set up custom automations for any type and multiple businesses. 65% of companies start using a CRM system within the first five years of business. Once implemented, the hive mind will save you on marketing, give you more time, and make more money. One of our users had his first $100,000 month using our system in June. We want to see you automate and accelerate your business. Text us at 210-972-1842 for future meetings and of course to get our $1 course on how to make more than six figures on one land deal. You can schedule your free demo today at hivemindcrm.io. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Today we have a special guest. It is Uncle Carl Spielgo from North Carolina. And welcome to the next episode of the Hive with Us podcast. I'm your host, Daniel Martinez. I'm here at Southern California. There he is, Uncle Carl, man of the hour. How's it going? Man, I'm good. I'm good. I guess you want to show your sign. I mean, you're, you're already pulling it out anyway. Let's see the sign. There you go. <laughs> we buy houses, 704-777-777. Houses and land. That's awesome, man. You're only local in, in North Carolina, right? We do most of our business in North Carolina, but we, we, we've done, we got some deals in California, Florida, South Carolina, Georgia, and you know, any, anywhere the deals are really effed up that that's, we'll, we'll go there. That's good. That's good. Now, one, one thing, one thing I like about what you do, you're a, you're a uh, deal problem solver and you solve big problems. That's always the, it's always a good thing. We, yes, we love deals. Anything that, you know, multiple missing heirs, judgments, bad title, excess proceeds, partition sales, variances, subdividing, assemblage, creative financing, anything that's, can I say fucked up? Or I probably can't say that on this thing. Can I? I mean, you already said it. I mean, okay. Anything that's different, screwed up, that, that's what we like to do. I really like hitting on the point because us as real estate investors have to be big problem solvers and that's what we specialize in. So I think you kind of take it a step above where you kind of solve difficult problems. Because yeah. not everybody solves difficult problems, they just solve problems. But it's, it's a cool niche to be in, and it's always interesting because you have the coolest stories. We've had a I had, I had a motorcycle gang after me one time when I stalked the wrong person. That was not fun. Had a gun pointed at my head. You know, I had to uh, open a goat farm to take advantage of the town of Tiga K. You know, there's always something. Yeah, always something crazy going on. Who knew becoming a real estate investor would get you having to break into houses, guns pulled on you, and all the shenanigans that comes along with it? Uh, you know, lawsuits occasionally, things like that, suing people. Try not to get into that too much, but it did happen. So, how long have you been in real estate? Because I, I feel like you've you've had like ten plus years of experience. I did it from two thousand, and then I did it to two thousand eight, and I lost everything. Everything oh, oh. came tumbling down, and I'd love to say it's because of 2008 and that that made it quicker but it was my business model i was buying for appreciation i was buying you know and then all of a sudden i had all these high interest loans and lost everything then i went into the used car business for a while with my ex-girlfriend which is really stupid don't ever go don't ever go into business with your ex-girlfriend and don't ever do used cars but we did buy here pay here and we learned a lot from that we had the police here every two weeks seriously every two weeks there's a problem yeah you, we did buy here pay here we're reaping cars in the middle of the night it, it, it was not fun and then i got back in this i got back in probably about six and a half years ago i was totally broke i didn't have any money and i, I got back into the business i think a lot of people got hurt during the the recession 2008 and for me i'm like i've never gone through a recession i'm like what's it gonna be like kind of like well, <laughs> this one was extraordinary. This was like none before the Great Depression. It took a lot of people down and it yeah. exposed a lot of weaknesses. I do things a lot differently now than I did then. So it, it, it was good in a way. It was very humbling and it was good that we I went through that stuff. You know, I mean, it, you, 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 gotta, you get wiser. You get wiser as it goes. 
and t- time is the best teacher. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, I'll jump right in and I'll tell you how I got back involved. So I'm totally broke. I have very little money. I have a used car dealership with my ex-girlfriend. It's going downhill fast. And so I went, I was going back to all these real estate meetups. I ran into a guy named Mitch Young. We'd done some business together and he had a property tax delinquent. He said, I got this deal. If you can find this guy, I will, you can find this guy, get him under contract. We'll give you half the deal. So I did some snooping on the uh, internet. The guy name is Lee Author. I found his resume. Turns out he's a used car turnaround specialist. Okay. So I called him up and said, Lee Author, I know I hear you used car turnaround specialist. My car dealership is, is, is struggling. It's doing really bad. Can you come up and help me? And he's like, sure. So he came up that weekend. So I hired him, scraped together. He did give me a really great deal, came up to my office. So we're in the office. And then I call my buddy Mitch up. I said, Mitch, you know that guy you're looking for? The author, he goes, I can't find him anywhere. I said, won't you come down to my office? He's in my office. He's like, what? The guy's in your office. So Mitch came down. We got to, he got, we, you know, met the guy. And then what we did is we let him go back to Columbia. So we're, I'm in Charlotte. He went back to Columbia. And then we called him up a day later and said, hey, you know what? You actually have a property still here in Charlotte. It's going to tax sale. Because he told me he didn't have anything. And I mean, who's crazy enough to hire someone to get to know them, for the chance to buy their property, you know? And that's, that, that was a little bit odd. But anyways, I called him up. And he said, well, we have an offer for 35000 He said, someone just called me. And I was like, Lee Arthur, you know us. You met us. We'll, we'll match that. I'll be down there, you know, an hour and a half. I drove down to Columbia and we got we signed the contract. We bought it for thirty five thousand. We ended up just clearing the lot, spent a few hundred bucks and sold it, made fifty eight thousand dollars. Wow. So Mitch is like, you're pretty good at this. I got another one for you. And he would feed me these tax delinquent ones. I would go search the people down, find them and then, you know, work the deal with them buy the property and we'd split the, the second one we made sixty eight thousand dollars on another lot wow. so like hey this this tax delinquent stuff's pretty good and then we started realizing a lot of the people uh, have a lot of the better deals people are, do- are deceased so we're like how do we do this so we started working with the attorneys and that's when we started learning how to buy shares and work through with judgments and all these different problems through the property by the way working property tax links won't work in your state or won't work in North Carolina. If you guys work in North Carolina, I'm the only one it works for. So stay, stay, stay away from the property tax delinquents in North Carolina because they, they're gold. He has the list and he's not selling it to nobody. That's what you're saying, right? It, it's easy. You can call the county and get the list. Anybody can get it, you know, but, but the, whole, the whole thing we want people to know is you have to work it. You have to, you have to pull it up. You have to look at it. See who's deceased. We build up family trees and they'll call the heirs. And we, this is how niche will get. We'll even look to see if there's judgments and then we'll even buy the, the ones with judgments on there too. And then we'll either discount the judgment, we'll let the judgment expire or we'll buy the judgment. And you can make huge profits that way. Listen, I want to talk about judgments a little bit because a lot of people don't understand the judgment and how it works. So one thing I really want to key in on is that you can negotiate judgments. Everything's like, I have a $10,000 judgment, I have to pay $10,000. And that's what most sellers think. That's what most wholesalers think. So let's kind of jump in down the judgment line a little bit. Yeah. So basically judgments are good for basically for 10 years. Check your statutes. I'm not an attorney. Blah, 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 blah. Check, check with your attorney, all the disclosures. Judgments are pretty much good for 10 years. Then they can renew them after that 10 years. Okay. Very few people do. And that you can also, if someone has a judgment, they can technically foreclose on the property. Very few people do. Like I've never seen the IRS foreclose. I'm not saying they won't. You know, Ford Motor Credit, I've never seen them foreclose. I've never seen HD Supply. So then the judgments are good for 10 years. They can renew them. Well, if you buy the property during that time and then they renew the judgment, it only renews against the person, not the property. And that's huge. But we love to search these things. Then once you get the judgment again, we, you can buy them. You can let them expire, which most of them do or you can call up and negotiate a discount. Now, I'll give you an example of a deal we did. It was on, it was a piece of property on Industrial Way in Charlotte. It was a lot owned by a defunct corporation and it had 25,000 delinquent property taxes, a $73,000 judgment to HD supply, 
a $63,000 judgment to Ford Motor Credit. We gave the owner $15,000 and we said, we'll take over all the problems. So you got judgments, you got taxes, you got defunct corporation. So, so we bought it through an attorney with title insurance subject to the judgments. That means everything's clean, you're good to go. You just have to deal with these judgments. The first thing we did is we called up the HD supply judgment. We skip traced them, called them up, and we offered them $15,000 to buy the judgment. And they're like, well, can you do 16? And we're like, sure. So we bought that $73,000 judgment for $16,000. The next one was Ford Motor Credit. Okay, Ford Motor Credit, there's a company called Smith Deadman in, Char in this area. They're the they're attorneys that do the foreclosing. So you actually have to call the foreclosing to uh, not the foreclosing, the one that did the got the judgment. Yeah. So you have to skip them. We called them. We also have you also have to have an authorization to release from the old owner saying you can speak on their behalf. Yeah. So we called them up. We negotiated the sixty three thousand judgment down to the twenty twenty two thousand. OK, then. So now we, we, we own the HD supply judgment. And the reason we bought the HD supply judgment is because it was in second position behind the taxes. And that way it's worth 73,000. I could get this, I can niche this down. I would get, so we could either go for excess proceeds on the sale, or we wanted to have, we wanted the Ford motor credit to be like, if we would have just paid off the judgment, then Ford motor credit goes in the second position. You understand? And so, so that, that's why we wanted to buy that judgment. We negotiated with the Ford motor credit for the discount. We sold the property and we made $143,000 on that deal. I've got Ooh. slides for it and maybe we'll, let me, let's do a hive mind where I've got the slides, the judgments, and I'll show you exactly, but just know that you can a lot of times do that discount or no, we could have done, we could have waited two and a half more years. Both those judges would expire. This is how much dumbasses Ford Motor Credit is and HD Supply. They don't even realize people have property. They don't even realize it's technically attached. They just pretty much let them go and expire for the most part. So it's learning which companies will will don't pay attention and whatever. You, you, so you guys can take over properties sometimes with judgments and then you know discount them, uh, let them expire or buy them. But they technically can foreclose during that time, but most of them don't. So I really, I have, I heard a nugget that probably went over like ninety nine percent of people's heads, but I really want to hone in on it. So no one talks about this. And I really want you to talk about it because no one knows about this unless you're you know specialized knowledge or someone like you. So what is excess proceeds? Because you you barely mentioned it. Okay, but it's such a big thing. But no, no, I want you to explain the other thing too, because how does XC's proceeds work in a real estate transaction? Because I guarantee you 90% of the people that hear this are like, what is he talking about? Well, I don't excess proceeds is whoever owns the property. Okay. Let's say it goes to a tax sale or foreclosure sale. Okay. Let's say the taxes are $12,000 and the property sells for a hundred thousand, right? There's about 88,000 in excess proceeds that's deposited with the clerk. And whoever owns the property at the end of the foreclosure sale or owns the property, you can go ahead and get that. Now there's some caveats there. Like if there's some other judgments, sometimes they come out and city lean. So, and then sometimes the foreclosing attorneys will charge a 5% fee. So you have to factor that in. So the property sells for 100,000, there'll be a, an, an extra fee for 5,000. So excess proceeds is basically whatever, whatever, let's say they're foreclosing on, you know, 12,000 taxes out, sells for 100, the 88,000 is excess proceeds. That's the cliff notes, that's the short version of excess proceeds. And there's a whole bunch of courses on that. And there's a ton of, we make a ton of money on the excess proceeds strategy too. So I, I want to break this down a little bit further for everybody who doesn't know what it means. So when I learned about real estate, I thought that whenever somebody was foreclosed on, that money just went in limbo and the seller never gets it. And for all the wholesalers out there, that is not the case. It technically goes to excess proceeds. Whoever holds the title gets the excess proceeds. They should wait for all the paperwork and pre foreclosure to go through and for all that stuff to go process. And then you can collect the excess proceeds. So it does not go in limbo. And I'm going to re reaffirm that. It is not going limbo. Somebody can collect that. If nobody collects it, it goes to overages and it just sits inside the treasury account for the state. 
and he then well, it's set in the clerk's office, and then eventually it's sheeted to the state, and they yep. get the money. So they, they love when they can do this because they, they make millions and millions a year yep. from these excess proceeds. But you know, we have to hire an attorney to do this, and it's not guaranteed. Okay, that's one thing I want to make sure people know. It's not a hundred percent guaranteed, but most of the times you can get those excess proceeds. You got to be careful because yeah. if you miss a judgment or something, you know, on the person, you have to run title too. You then then the judgment holder can apply for excess proceeds. Yeah, and I'll, I'll give you. Let me give you a perfect example. We bought a house from an heir. There's it, there's a house that's being foreclosed on. There was one heir. We paid them five hundred dollars for for the, their deed. They just want to get out of it. They had a judgment that was up to eleven thousand dollars in accruing interest. Most judgments accrue interest, so this had accrued up to nineteen thousand. I skip traced the judgment holder and bought that judgment for two thousand two hundred fifty bucks. When we applied for excess proceeds, we applied to get the money from the judgment uh, that we own that judgment now. So we got a check for 19,000 plus we got the rest of the overage on the property. So that's, you know, if it's niche, if it's strange, weird, we want to learn it. We want to run with it, you know, and we do all sorts of stuff. Now here's the thing too, is we do a lot, a lot of these properties, you know, a lot of tax delinquents, people passed away. And most of those times people don't open an estate. So there's no probate. So what we do is we build the family tree and then we'll buy out the heirs shares. Okay. And this was what's really cool. If you don't get all the heirs shares, then let's say we end up with 75% of it. We can do what's called a partition sale where we force the whole property to be sold. When it goes to sale at the courthouse, you win either way. If it sells for low, you buy it, you own 75%. If it goes for high, you let it go and collect the excess proceeds. So most of the time we're able to get the heirs together, buy the properties and own them. And, but if we can't, we have multiple exit strategies. I, I guess I'm getting too niche in, in, into this stuff, but. No, it, it's good, man, because I, I love the conversation because like excess proceeds, I've only, I, I had, a, I took a, I took a special ed course on overages. So I learned about excess proceeds and how it records real estate. I'm like, Oh my goodness. I, I've been in real estate for three, four years and didn't hear about this till now. Like no one knows this. And then I met another investor in California and that's what he does. He knew about the strategy. I'm like, Oh, this is brilliant. And then you mention it and I'm like, okay, all the people that do niche title work and niche uh, real estate, they all know this stuff and they don't like no one, no one ever talks about it because it's so specialized knowledge that you really have to know the ins, ins and outs. And it's such it's such a great little nugget out there for everybody to do some research on excess proceeds, uh, lien positions, all that stuff because it's important whenever you're doing troubled 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 title, all that stuff. It you, all you, run, you, you run into a lot of in the tax delinquents in the foreclosures. You know, you'll run into a lot of the problems because they're not paying their tax. There's usually a problem. Someone's dead. There's a judgment. All sorts of stuff. And then, like, we love land. I guess you guys sort of like land a little bit too, don't you? Yeah, a little bit here and there. <laughs> a, little, a little bit here and there. So one of the things we look for lots that are too small to build on. Okay. And we do what, what are called variances. It has to be a lot of record. I think before 1998, there's certain criteria that has to meet. Okay. And so what we do is we find these lots. We'll buy them for cheap. Like we bought, we got this one lot for $500, 210 Walford, part of a package. I'll throw this lot in. It's not buildable. It's too small. Well, we hired a variance attorney. We went through and the variances, they basically take it in front of the, the city and they say we have a hardship and they allow us to, to move the buildability line lines out. So it's buildable. They're basically taking something that's too small and and for the easy, best way. And then they they say we're going to let you build on it. So we're taking these lots that are too small. So we bought this one at 210 Walford. We did the variance on it. We sold it for ninety five thousand. We made eighty four thousand. We bought another one at. at on 17th street for 23,000 got the variance and we sold that for, I think it was like 160. Okay. Uh, another one in East 19th street, small lot. And it's better if I show you, but we bought it for 12,500 and sold it for 140. So, you know, it's another niche thing we're looking at in the variance. What's cool is sometimes we'll find lots that are 40 foot wide 
okay? And it requires 50 foot to build on. Well, we can get a variant. If there's a lot of record before, I think 1998 or 1992, we can hire our attorney, David Murray in Charlotte. He's a great attorney and he'll go through and get, so we, we got this one lot that was 40 feet did, wide, did the variance and sold that. So there's all sorts of types of variances that you can do. It's not just small lots. It's just things like that. And so there's this whole realm. What I really want people to know, there's a whole realm of stuff out there, you know, that you can do. There's this thing called lots of record where like I'm giving away way too much shit. I'm probably going to get my butt kicked here in Charlotte. But we, we found these 100 foot lots that are zoned R4. R4, you need 60 foot of frontage, right? People are like, you can't subdivide that. It's 100 feet. But I can use this grandfathered lots of record, subdivide them and put them back to two lots. So I have this unfair advantage learning these. These are basically zoning loopholes and legal loopholes. You know, I want to learn those. And then I want to take that same thing and run with it over and over and over again. And that, that, that's a great way to make money. Learn a legal loophole, a grandfathered zoning clause, look for those and repeat, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat over and over and over again. One thing I think is really cool about what you do and a lot of people that do stuff like what you do in general is that you guys are literally rebuilding the neighborhood for stuff that's been sitting there for 30 years, untouchable, unbuildable, worthless in most people's eyes. You're actually making it worthwhile making it profitable, making it worth something. So it's it's a huge, you're changing the outlook of the landscape all by yourself. Yeah, what I like about it too is like with the heirs, a lot of times there's, on some of these deals, we have one right now with 50 something heirs, okay? So we build these trees out, we bought, you know, this house, you know, nobody would have cleared the title one for us. So we, we bought it out, we're almost the way through. So we, we've got one with 21 heirs, one with like 50 heirs, and you know these are things, and these are things where people are not going to get any money, okay? They, they're not going to put it together. It's free money to them, okay? When I call them up and say you're heirs to 533 Selden, da 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 da, you know, and they're like, yeah, I sort of remember that was Aunt Martha's house, and, and you know, I'm like, okay, we're paying X dollars for your share. They're happy because it's it's found money to them. Yeah, it was something me, that, something me, they didn't even know they had. Yeah, and let me tell you about, about our biggest deal ever uh, on a single family home. It was a house that was vacant. And this, this is another air deal. It's found money to them. And it was, let me see, vacant house. Some squatters moved in. The guy had passed away. Okay. So what we did is that we built our own family trees now. Okay. At the time we hired a genealogist, built the family tree out. And the rightful heirs were Jack and Lewis Anders. Okay. And long story, but their father died in a plane crash and creep. We get into this stuff. We get into this. Like we learn all this. Stuff. Their father died in a plane crash in Crete in 1973. Okay. And so they were the rightful heirs. We couldn't find them anywhere. We searched and we searched. We're like, what are we doing wrong? So I went back to the funeral home where, where Frank that held his funeral and I got the funeral book. OK, and I skipped traced every single person that went to the funeral. I read the book, wrote them down. And then someone told me, said, yeah, Jack and Lewis, their mom got remarried to a police officer outside D.C. We're like, well, what if she changed the boys names? Ding, 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 ding. We found this article, Hoffman Marys Anders. And we were, a we were and so we we're able to find them. And here's the thing, too. The uh, Frank had died without a will in test eight, and you're supposed to probate it. Okay, but if somebody here's a here's a little loophole in North Carolina it doesn't always play. Somebody's been dead over two years, you don't have to uh, open an estate. We didn't want to open the estate. We're afraid of what might happen, so we're like, so this is important. When you talk to him, it's like here's the situation: your uncle Frank owned this property. We're buying it without title insurance. There's vagrants in the house. There's city code. It's going to auction in two weeks, which was for tax foreclosure. And there's a there's a niece that actually had a lease in the property to 20, 40 for a dollar. OK, and so we, you got all these problems. And I said, we'll give you thirty five thousand. So part of when you're doing this, you have to set the table. You have to sort of say, look, these are all the problems. If you want to take it on, it's your property, but we'll give you X dollars. And they're like, well, seems like there's a lot of problems here. And the second thing they said after that, they said, this is found money. If you wouldn't have found us, we never would have got it. Oh, it's also partially in a flood zone. 
Okay. So we're like, these are all the problems. So I said, we'll take your 35,000 because you're buying it without title insurance. So we bought it, kept it two years. We sold it for 310 and we made 243,000. That's after paying bonuses to the, to, to the bird dog that found it. So what I want to get is the, the, it, this is found money most of the time to people or they can't put it together. So that, that's what I really like about it, man. And this is all through the tax delinquent list. This is, this is tax delinquent driving for dollars. And then another thing we do is we take our GIS system. We look for double lots, triple lots, houses with land. We look for lots that can be combined and re subdivided. We look for all this stuff. We put it in a spreadsheet and then we skip it and we call them because it's like, it's a value add. We know that there's extra value there if we can buy the property. Yeah. So that's another way. And I'll tell you a quick example. There's a property on campus street. Okay. 13 heirs took us a year to get this done. Long story, but we finally bought it. We bought it for 62,000. Then, then we saw there's a one, lot right in front of it. This is better visual. And I'll show you this in the hive mind. There's a lot right in front of it. And we're like, if we buy the lot in front of it, we could, can we subdivide it into four lots facing the other road? So we called the zoning department up and they said, yeah, if you get this other lot. So I, I, I kid around this uncle Carl math, one plus one divided by three equals four. Okay. So we bought it, got it approved to, to, to subdivide into four lots, sold it. We made $166,000. So we're looking for that value add. We're looking for opportunities. And most people would not have looked for that. But if you, if you can just dive a little bit deeper, spend some time looking how you can reconfigure the lots and subdivide them, you can make a fortune. So that was, that was a really nice hit on that deal. One, one of the things that, I, and for everybody wants to get into niche real estate, it takes time. <laughs> it takes time. Like every deal, every deal you mentioned is like in six months, a year, two years. Fit the airs like what? Well, we, we do some quick wholesaling stuff. We do have some 60 day, 30 days. Most of our deals, six months plus from the start to finish. It takes time working on these deals with the airs or, you know, subdividing or with the judgments, you know. But here's another little thing, too, that's really cool is. In Charlotte, I'm sure this happens. There's a lot of houses that were demoed, like their houses, they didn't meet code. They demoed them. Well, the city puts a 10 to $14,000 demo lien on it. Well, the lien, the demo judge, the judges are only good for 10 years. So we're buying properties with eight years worth of, you know, eight years into the judgment. And we're just waiting two more years for the judgment to fall off so far. Now, I hope there's nobody from Charlotte watching this in the city, but they don't renew their, 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 their demo leads. They just, they just fall off. So we buy these lots, you know, and then we just wait for the judgment liens the fall, the, the expire. Yeah. That's, that's huge, man. That's huge. She's just buying. Yeah. Wait, one thing I was curious about too, that I, I've never looked into, you said you were buying the judgments. Do you go in there as like a, like a cash buyer? Like, Hey, I want the judgment on eight, one, two, three main street. I want to buy this lien. What we you have to like like we'll have to what we have to do is we'll pull the pull the file from the courthouse and we'll read it and they'll say, you know, like like Smith Deadman does some whatever like whatever Chip Tiffany's attorney that did it, and then we'll just call the attorney. So like you have to go in, you pull the title work, you get the judgment, and then you have to go in and pull the judgment, read over that and see which attorney is handling the judgment. Typically it's typically it's handled by an attorney, not always. Then you have to call call them and then you just this is what I say. I say I'm Carl Spill with Alliance Finance and we buy bad judgments or old uh, old judgments and I noticed you have one. I'm sort of just curious what your plans are. And then you shut up and you listen. You know, like like for example, the one that I bought for 2250 bucks, I just called the guy up and said your judgment's about eight years old, not it's gonna expire. I'm just curious what your plans are. He goes, Well I, I don't know. And I'm like, well, I can buy it from you. And I said, he goes, well, how much? I said, 2,250. He goes, sold, done, done. I'm like, damn, I should have offered less. But what you can get is if you, here's another, yeah. So anyways, this is this, I love this stuff. It's so exciting. So it's pretty easy. You just have to skip trace, call them and then negotiate, negotiate to purchase the judgments. Or if you have a property, you might be negotiating a discount to pay it off. A lot of times that's what we'll do. We'll negotiate a discount. To, you know, to pay it off. 
Have you ever bought a judgment and foreclosed? Yes. A deal I shouldn't have done. This was a deal that our friend Brian Linky brought to five attorneys. He said, you guys, he said, you guys can't do this. It's too complicated. So I'm like, I can do anything. Okay. I was like, Mr. Billy Badass. Shouldn't have done this deal, but th this is how it worked. So there was a first mortgage to an IRA, a second mortgage to a private individual, a whole bunch of different judgments against the property. So these judgments came later. So what we did is we skip traced one of the judgment holders. And this is what we said. We called him up and said, hey, look, you have a judgment. What happened? You know, tell me what happened. He goes, oh, this guy screwed me over and he owes me a lot of money. I said, you're very far back. There's a first mortgage, a second mortgage, all these other judgments. It doesn't look like you're going to get anything. He goes, no, probably not. I said, how would you like to make a little bit of money and get the guy back? This is, you can look this up in charge, 3101 Florida, okay? What we did was we basically rented his judgment and we foreclosed on the property to get ownership. And we owned the property. But we still had to do with the first mortgage, yep. the second mortgage. So we negotiated the first mortgage, a discount, okay? The second mortgage, we negotiated and get them down to $7,500. And we negotiated discounts and liens with all the other ones. We made $75,000 on it. It wasn't worth the time, but it was, it was for proof of concept, it was worth doing and for bragging rights. But it really all the time we spent, it, it, it was it was so much. But so the point is, you can get a judgment and foreclose and own the property. And some people do that. But you also got to look at the title where the judgment falls in line. Now, if it's, if it's in the beginning and it's a pretty big judgment, that's one you'd love to buy, you know, because you're going to pick up the most equity. And you can wipe out everybody else when you when you foreclose. Was that? And you can wipe out all the other positions. I, I think it depends. It depends if the property sells for hundred thousand, your judges for seventy five thousand. There's going to be twenty five thousand that anybody else can get and apply for. So uh, that's something you need to talk to an attorney. And I'm not an attorney, but it it pretty much does. I think, but I think there can be excess which some of the other judgment lien holders could go after, depending on what the amount of your judgment is damn we're niching down to some weird shit aren't we yeah but I, I mean and here's like i said you can correct me if i'm wrong i thought like if if you let's say there's five judgments you you buy a second position when you buy and foreclose on second position you can technically wipe out three four and five right i think it depends it depends and i think it depends i think it depends on like how much your judgment's for Let's say you, you and, and I'm not an expert on this. I don't, you know, but let, or let's just say you buy the first position and that judgment's worth 50,000, you foreclose and the property sells for more than that. I think those other judgment holders can get up to that amount. But I think as a rule of thumb, you're right. You buy the judgment foreclosed, it, it'll wipe out most of the others typically. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, that, and that's something you need to talk to an attorney about. Mm. So. so, and like I said, your judgment list, do you actually c contact the the place and like, hey, what properties do you have judgments on? Are you looking at properties first, then doing we, like a small poll? We back into all the judgments. It's by going up to tax delinquents. It's by referrals and foreclosure. So we're backing into them, and we run title. We find them. Mm. And, and another one we love to find is IRS judgments. So we bought a house at forty five forty eight Strangford. It had a, all the other people ran like, oh, my God, it's got $100,000 in IRS judgments. So we're like, hey, we'll buy it. It was a foreclosure. We paid 73000 My partner, Mitch, put 73000 IRA, gave the owners a couple thousand dollars. There was $100,000. No, the IRS judgments or liens are only good for 10 years, and they typically don't renew them. If they renew them because we put it into the land trust, it only renews against the person. So we bought it with all the judgments, we rented it out, and then we sold it four years later. We made $147,000 on that deal. Now, I've never seen the IRS foreclose. I'm not saying they won't, but my experience, I've never seen that happen. We just buy them and we wait out, we wait out the IRS uh, judgments. Well, I mean, I think it goes back to like the IRS is they're there to collect taxes, they're not there to own property. So they're just gonna wait till somebody fixes it or if it falls off. <laughs> Yeah, that, that, that we bought several of that and we waited the IRS out, you know, a little nerve wracking, but it's paid off really good for us.
And I think it comes down to measuring your risk. And it seems like you, you're buying these deals so deep that you're willing to weigh that risk. Yep. That's I mean, at some point, we're going to, I told my partners, at some point, we're going to have a 50, 60, $70,000 loss. But if we keep winning with these big ones, if we have a 60 or $70,000 loss, we're playing with house money now. So I'm okay with that. And we probably will at some point have a 60, $70,000 loss. And I'll come back on and told you, tell you how we lost 60 or 70,000. It's going <laughs> to happen. It's going to happen at some point. But, you know, we $166,000 profit, 243, 228,000. You make these big profits, you know, you're going to have a loss somewhere when you're buying these things with bad title, title issues. So far, we, we haven't had any more than some small, small losses. So. No, it got me curious because, like I said, I understand a lot of this stuff. It's just I haven't haven't really delved into it out here in California. It's just one of those things where, like, I have I have I'm a I'm a sponge of information, and I, and I love this stuff too because it's it's kind of funny how, like, all this all this judgment stuff, and it's so cool that you bought a judgment and foreclosed because, like, I, in my head, I would, like, if I had the money and time, I would probably do that too just for fun. Just to, just well, to see yeah, we paid two we paid two thousand dollars to basically we we. Well, we just rented his judgment. We gave him two thousand dollars foreclosed, put the property in, and we gave him the judgment back, and he released it against the property, so he could still go after the guy. You rented a judgment? That's on that one at thirty one hundred one Florida. We basically used his judgment to foreclose to get the ownership, and then he released it from the property, but he still let him keep the judgment, so he could go after other stuff the guy had. Ah, that's crazy. <laughs> Judgments are so interesting. Uh, it's crazy how it works, but that's, that's so that's so interesting, man. Now I'm like in my head. I'm like, what property? How many properties are out there that have judgments on them that you can negotiate and buy a judgment and get a badass deal? Hundreds. I mean, thousands and thousands. Thousands. Like, you're going with these tax delinquents. There'll be people that had cars that got repoed. So there'll be a six or seven thousand dollar judgment or more for for the car. A lot of times. I mean, the rule of thumb, and I'm not saying right, is you can almost always get 50% off on a judgment, almost always, depending. And sometimes you can get them for pennies on the dollar. It all, it sort of all depends on the situation. So and the, my, my, my brain goes the other way. So people that are in debt, for anybody who out there in debt and has judgments on you or for any type of debt consolidation, you can technically get an LLC, say you're a debt consolidator and buy your own debt on a pennies on the dollar. It, yeah, it, it's possible. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's a, it's a I, I like I like providing the knowledge that not a lot of people think about, but it gets the wheels turning and people's like, okay, I know my my cousin is in a lot of debt, going through a lot of financial problems. If they came into some windfall of money, they can technically contact, have somebody else contact their debt and buy it fifty cents on the dollar or cheaper. Or or, or 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 just discount it and pay it off. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot there's a lot of bad debt out there that people will take pennies on the dollar for just to get paid. You know, uh, it's one of those. My mind just goes there, and it's kind of, I think it's kind of funny because like a lot of people in those situations, they think it's the end of the world, and like for us, we're like, yeah, you'd probably get it thirty cents on the dollar, fifty cents on the dollar. <laughs> yeah, it all depends on the situation. So uh, the, this is kind of going to the tangent of debts. There's a, a guy on, he has an HBO, he does a comedy show, John Oliver. He bought like like millions of dollars with the debt, pennies in the dollar, and he forgave all the debt. He forgave like, like $100 million with the debt because he bought it so cheap. And then he sent like letters out to all these people that he forgave all this debt that he just bought. And it was one of those things where like a lot of people like medical debt, credit card debt, all these different types of judgments, like all this stuff. There's a gray area, and once you understand it, you yeah, can, you can. Move I'm sure it. he bought it for like five cents on the dollar or something like that. Exactly. Like if, if if you're buying that much debt, you can probably get it really cheap. And then it's just people, <laughs> there's just people out there capitalizing on this information, which is why I love this. This is such a great call. And this is some whoever this is. I wish I I wish I could figure a way to figure out how this is, but he just blew my mind. But, and this is one of those things like you don't know, you don't know what you don't know. But once you understand how the process works, how the whole judgment leans, like you can understand the process and it kind of opens your mind to limitless possibilities. Yeah, uh, like like here's another example. These houses that were demoed in, in, in Charlotte, I'm sure there's elsewhere, sometimes there's mortgages still out there, right? So like that somebody had a house and it got in bad shape, the city demoed it. 
And then the mortgage company said, eh, you know, it's still technically attached to the property. They stopped paying the taxes. And so far, we've been able to get the mortgages. We're 100% successful so far. I'm not saying we're also on getting the mortgages released from the property. Okay. So we had one at 4109 Glenwood where we gave some money, some money up front. We knew there's an old mortgage. So what happens is taxes are always in first position no matter yep. what. Okay. Yep. So what happens with the house got demoed, then the taxes didn't get paid for years and years. So they're now in first position. So this mortgage company, they're just like, there's nothing left. So when we do our legal filings that they have a certain amount of time to respond, if they don't, our attorneys mark the mortgage satisfied and we're able to resell the property. And that Ooh. that's just another little niche, a little, another little nugget that we learned just by jumping in you know a lot of stuff we'll if we can get a little bit of money we'll, we'll we'll buy something or we'll partner with the person and we'll just try to figure it out and that that was really cool so we, we've done quite a few of those and that those have been great windfalls because the people know usually heirs there's a mortgage they're behind on the taxes there's a demo lien they're like you know we'll give them a little bit of money we'll go through and work through through everything get the mortgage released and and then and, and we'd be able to resell the, the the property and here's another little thing i learned like a lot of this stuff guys is getting in and figuring it out along the way there was a product okay there's i live in mecklenburg county the county next to us is gaston county so i was looking at this property in gaston county and i was negotiating to buy it and we ran title and the guy and the guy lives in mecklenburg and he had tons of irs liens against him i'm like oh man I'm not gonna be able to buy this property. We're done. Well, here's a gold nugget. IRS liens are only good in the county they're filed in. They Ooh. didn't file any of the ones in Mecklenburg County. It didn't attach to the house. So I was able to negotiate a really good deal in terms with the guy to buy the house. So that's just a little, I mean, does it happen very often? No, but if you know to look for some of these things, then every now and then that'll happen. Like every now and then we'll get one of these small lots that for next to nothing or cheap that we can do the variance on every now and then we'll see one like the campus street there's one lot plus one divided by three is four so we have you have all these little niche things that you learn maybe you do two variances a year maybe you do, do a couple of the, the redo and re-subdivide but if you're making 166,000 100,000 whatever then, you know 100,000 here and there it starts to add up to real money after a while so I have a question about the IRS lien. So the IRS lien does not attach in the county. Does it still attach to him or did you negotiate it down since it wasn't attached to the county? Well, it was still attached to him, but because it's filed in Mecklenburg and he owned a house in Gaston County, we were able to buy that. We didn't have to negotiate any on, with the IRS because the lien didn't attach to that one property. It's gotcha. in Gaston County. Gotcha. Okay. Check with your attorneys, all that kind of disclosure, da, 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 da. But that, I mean, again, does it happen very often? No, but it, it it's just something it because it does happen. It happens. You know? I, I love this conversation, man, because this uh, judgments and airships, and it's, it's, it's fun. It's fun. It's fun to piece it all together. And it's like putting together a puzzle that pays you thousands of dollars at the end. <laughs> yeah. It, it takes a lot of time. And you have to put your money up front on a lot of these deals, you know, because who's going to sell you, who's going to loan money on a property where you own nine tenths of, you know, it's like, Hey, you got a hard money. money. Can you loan me money? I own nine tenths of this property. They're, they're going to look at you. It's crazy. So it does take some, you know, you have to put your money in these messy things, but the paydays are huge. Do you do like ovation type deals? I think you do because you're almost like you know, partner with the seller that we bring less money to the table because you're just put at that point you're just putting up your time. Well, we we have not done any ovation deals yet. We okay. we know a little bit about them, but we have not done any like that. I mean, it sounds like you've done them in, in your own way, just not called them ovations. <laughs> yeah. Well, like like I'll tell you about another one. It's a property tax delinquent deal. It was a commercial building, okay, and we skip traced the guys behind on taxes. He left town. We found him. We called him. We started talking to him. And, we, and, he, and he asked, well, is that building still standing? I'm like, yes, it's still standing. But in, in, in Charlotte, like if commercial buildings been abandoned for a certain period of time, they we, we were worried about code enforcement. And if we had to renovate it, sometimes they'll make, if it's been abandoned a certain amount of years, you're going to have to bring it up to today's code. So we didn't want to really buy it. 
So we were trying to negotiate back and forth. And then we finally said, hey, let's do this. Let's partner on the deal. OK, first of all, you didn't even realize the building was still standing. OK, so let's partner on the deal. So we ended up again because we were afraid of code. We're afraid of, of what the city might make us do. So we didn't want to put our cash into this building. So we said, look, we're good at marketing. We'll put some money into it, which we did. We clean it up and then then we'll split the profits 50 50. He's like, sure. So we formed a LLC, not a land trust, basically LLC where he got 50 percent of the beneficial interest. We got 50 percent of the beneficial interest. The reason we did that is we didn't want any more judgments and stuff to attach. Well, it turns out there was an old deed of trust open and the, there's an old mortgage on it. And the owner of that was deceased. So long story, we made a deal to pay him out. We went to we went to the owner's relatives and worked out a deal for them to satisfy the mortgage. And then we sold it. And we made ninety thousand dollars on about a three or four thousand dollar total investment because I was just cleaning it out and putting it into a partnership. So sometimes partnerships work with sellers in certain. See, that's another thing, too. We've learned all sorts of creative ways. Sometimes it makes sense to partner with them. This one, it made sense for us to partner because we didn't want to take the risk of having to bring it to code with, and, and what the city would and, and city code enforcement. So we partnered, put it into our own land trust, think of it as LLC, and then it protected both of us because of any judgments. So no more judgments or problems could happen to the property. And then we sort of were able to get through this old deed of trust that was still open on the property. And so uh, that's, there's just so many ways to do stuff out there. It's just, it's just, it's just crazy how you can structure stuff, you know? What is a quote that is yours or somebody else's that you resonate with? I can't think of anything off the top of my head. Uh, you know, a little bit, you make your own luck. I think that people are like, Carl, you got lucky on this deal. You got lucky on this. I think by taking action and putting stuff out in the universe, you make luck and then, you know, but I don't have any really quote, any kind of real quotes that I can say, but I'll give you a quick example, of making your own luck. Okay. This is a, um, we got a property, two owners, this lot on Bearwood guy names with Bryant. I can't remember Bryant. And then, okay. Anyways, there's two owners, right? Skip trace. We make a deal to buy half the lot. And then there's another half. The guy's name was Demario Fleming. Okay. And, we couldn't find them. This is sort of in the beginning. We're just good. So we're trying to find Demario everywhere. And I'm like, man, I can't find this guy. We're closing out. We only buy half this thing. What are we going to do? So I was at this real estate meeting, uh, Linda Dana's real estate meeting. And I was talking to a guy next to me. His name was Gary Boger. And I was said, hey, look, you know, we we're talking about different deals. Like, hey, I got half this deal. And I got, I said, I just got to find this other half. This guy named is Demario Fleming. And I, I got to, I can't find him anywhere. He said, who do you say? I said Demario Fleming. He goes, he's one of my best friends. He lives in Florida. He opened his phone, called him up, and said, Demario, I got someone who wants to buy half that lot you own. And he handed me the phone. Demario happened to be flying in that weekend, okay, for a funeral. And we we're trying to close it Monday or Tuesday. So I convinced him to pay for his hotel room to stay over another night. And he did. But that was lucky. But I put it out in the universe and it, it and it came through so uh, being in action and stuff you're going to create your own luck so I, I really believe people create their own luck so that's the best thing i can get to a saying i wouldn't say it's really a saying but you, you, if you're out there doing stuff you're going to make luck come to you no i, I think it's, i think it's a valid statement because a lot of people they they they're waiting for the opportunity and you can wait your whole life <laughs> For an opportunity to come across <laughs> people are like i'm waiting for the downturn i'm waiting for the downturn well you're being a dumbass there's opportunities everywhere i don't care how high the market is between these judgments these errors the zoning loopholes people that just want to sell there's opportunities everywhere so if you're waiting for the downturn and i'm just kidding i can understand why i'm not really calling people dumbasses but i'm just trying to say is don't wait for that. There's opportunities everywhere. Go out and make your own luck. Go out and figure this stuff out along the way. This is the United States. There's more opportunities here than anywhere else. This is such a phenomenal fucking country with opportunities out there. And there's people like you guys, 
sharing information, your high bind CRM and stuff. There's all this stuff out here. You, you just got to be in action. You got to learn and surround yourself with good people and you're going to be successful. Man, I, I appreciate that, man. Make your own luck. Go out there, do the work. There's no shortcuts in life. Only only, only shortcut you're going to get is uh, if you do more work. <laughs> But I think I think it's it's it, it's one of the things. Here's another thing that's really helped us. Okay, we spend a lot of money with attorneys. Okay, so I took my two attorney buddies out and we spent twelve hundred fifty dollars for one meal. And I, of course, I get them liquored up as I can, and then they, you know, they'll start getting really drunk. Is well, can you tell me some like like really cool zoning stuff or really cool stuff? Like, man, here you need another tequila. This is a thirty five dollar tequila. You hand it to them, and then they start. I'm sort of kidding, but truthful. But by spending time with the attorneys, they're telling you all sorts of really cool stuff. I spent a lot of time with my surveyor. This is another thing. I went out the other day with my surveyor, spent one hour. I'm not kidding. I will make three hundred to five hundred thousand dollars off what he showed me. Seriously, Ooh. how to subdivide certain things, how to do certain things. So one of the things too is if you can learn the niches, talk to the surveyors, talk to the zoning people. You know, talk to the investors that are doing creative stuff. Then you—that's your path quicker to that niche, that stuff that people don't talk about. That you can make a ton of money. It's like the judgment stuff. You know, it's talking to a lot of attorneys, figuring that out. I'm like, you can buy a judgment? Okay. I didn't. You know, when I first, I didn't know any of this stuff. But it was just talking to attorneys, investors, and figuring out. And if you spend a lot of your time doing that then you and learning these things you, you guys can you guys can do really well in this business so uh, i heard an interest I, i'm a, I, I go on tiktok a lot because I, I produce stuff on tiktok so I, I pay attention to stuff on tiktok i saw this uh younger guy he's a business professional he said he wanted to learn specialized knowledge so he went out and found the person he wanted to learn from and asked her how much do you get paid a month she's like oh, about eight to ten thousand dollars a month he's like i will pay you nine thousand dollars for eight hours of your time and she's like, what? She's like, you want three days? And she's like, no, 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 eight hours. So the lady went in and made a whole, she took a month of her time to create a presentation, an eight hour presentation for this one guy for $9,000. And he soaked up all the information in one day. It, it, it's worth it. $9,000. It like, like if you can learn one or two things that you can replicate. Oh my God. I'm that, that meeting with my surveyor was incredible. It blew my mind. I'm like, you can't subdivide it this way. He goes, ah, yes, you can. You know, it's like you have to do this and this and this. I'm like, holy shit. You know, it's, it's like, and we've already done three or four deals from what he showed us. So we've already put it into play. So now we have these niche things, this knowledge that a lot of people don't have. Yeah. So that, that you made a great point there with that person. $9,000 for the put the presentation on how to make money over and over again. That's cheap. That's cheap. It's you cheap. Know? It's cheap when when you have the when you actually have the ability to take action on it and you understand different facets of it. So if you already know what you're coming at, from what from what specialized knowledge you can you require from them, you can absorb it all quickly and pay pay them for the price that for them a day nine thousand dollars is a is a, a exorbitant amount of money. But you're for you you can actually use your marketing side and bring in your skills to make your return exactly make it make it work. I mean so. Yeah. So I, I really wanted to bring that up because that was such a huge nugget. The specialized knowledge you get from your title company, your surveyor, your attorneys, all that stuff is going to be priceless for you. And you can leverage that forever, especially if you're local and you do business locally so heavily. And, and the, key, the key is to get them really drunk so they <laughs> loosen up and they tell you more. So, And you got to pay for that sometimes. And you got to pay for it with a good time sometimes. I, yeah. I, tell my, I tell my wife all the time, like, I, I'm going to go take somebody out to dinner. She's like, you're going to have fun. I'm like, no, I'm working. I'm working right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's both. You're working, you're having fun, and you're learning a lot of great stuff. So for anybody out there that wants to learn things quickly, sometimes you have to pay for it up front. But if you're, if you're going to use that, if you're going to use that information wisely and in the future, it's worth paying for always, always worth paying for uh, and let me plug plug. I have a mastermind group. It's way, 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 way too cheap. It's one hundred five dollars a month. It's called Uncle Carl with a K. Uncle Carl and Friends Mastermind Group. We share this kind of stuff. We also bring specialists in. Like we brought my friend Erica in. She's a genealogist. 
She builds family trees. She, she, she helps find people. We brought DeAndre from the hive mind's been on there. He broke down his whole business. I couldn't believe he showed. He showed exactly how he makes money to everybody. I was like, DeAndre, you just showed everybody your whole business thing. He's like, I'm fine. He had abundance mentality. So, you know, we bring people like this into there. Oh, and we had Daniel, we even had Daniel on. So it joined my mastermind. It's $105 a month. It's cheap and you get a lot of great information, a lot of different people and stuff. So, so how do we find that again? Uncle Carl's mastermind. Uh, I, should, I should have a link, but if you Google uncle Carl, the K uncle Carl and friends mastermind group. Oh, Erica is here. I didn't realize she was here. Hey, Erica. She did a phenomenal presentation last night. We were on for like two or three hours, finding heirs, finding people, you know, it was just, and just sharing how you can actually do it yourself. It was a phenomenal, phenomenal meeting last night. So well, that's, that's awesome, man. The reason why I do this and the reason why I do this as a whole is because I, I, and I tell this to people all the time is I support people that support people and us people that support people were making a driving force to the real estate community, the education community. And it's just really providing information freely that everybody else can capitalize on it. The reason why, like uh, the reason why, like I share information freely, not everyone's going to take action. Like, if people can listen to the same conversation the last hour we just had and pull five things out of it and do some research on it, they can become a millionaire in five years. Easily. By the way, if you make money, please send me a small cut. You know, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll leave my phone number too. If people want to, it's best if you text me. How do I put, how do I do, you get this stream thing. I'm not used to this. I'm used to. Uh, send it through here to the chat and I'll put it up here. Okay. Okay. And I'll put this, it up. this is my personal phone number. I prefer people text first, but you know, we love to talk real estate, joint venture, probably 20 to 25% of our deals come from joint ventures and working with people. So yeah, reach out to me, join the mastermind. I need to come up with a course because this, I'm not bragging. I'm just excited that I've learned all this stuff. It's people that shared stuff with us, you know, in depth research that we've learned all this really super cool. So, and, I, and I could have talked for hours about the air stuff. We hardly even got into that. There's so many exit strategies when you're doing airs and stuff. It's just, it's crazy. No, it's, it's a good time, man. I appreciate your time. I appreciate it. Go, Uncle Carl and Friends Mastermind. Go check it out. It's worth it. As you can see, he provides value freely. And there's plenty of information out there. And you can use the specialized knowledge to make a lot of money with it. You just got to take action. You just got to take action. Take I action. Make I appreciate your time. Luck. All right. Okay. You make your own luck. Get you out there and be in action. Then you make your own luck and you got to take action. I appreciate yeah. your time. Catch us on the next episode. Uncle Carl, thanks for coming on. It was a great episode. The show is sponsored by The List Guys. Do you need more leads in your local or virtual market? One in 10 small businesses don't invest in any kind of marketing. The List Guys have over 35 plus list types to choose from and you can mix and match any list or criteria. We also use the skip trace list and provide up to seven numbers and email addresses. Every list you purchase will be scrubbed against previous purchases. The List Guys are here to save you time. Contact the List Guys today at www.1listguys.com. That's www.the number one listguys.com.